Father, we commit this moment of your word within your hands. The Bible says you sent your word and your word healed them. Let the word of this morning that you have prepared for us may bring about healing, deliverance, and fulfill your divine purposes in the name of Jesus. Bless the hearers. Let this word may be a seed in the good ground of their heart that this seed may produce fruit so much so that your name may be glorified. We submit down ourselves under the authority of your words and we pray that you may have your way. Rule over us. Speak to us in Jesus' name. And we say, Amen. Amen. Glory to the living God. Allow me, before we go into the word of God, just to uh, wish you all a happy Easter. It is a blessing to have you. It is a blessing to have you either here in the house or online. And we pray that the Lord may be glorified in your life and bless you as you are listening into to the word of God. This morning my, my topic is titled, uh, The Benefit of uh, the Cross. The Benefit of the Cross. Uh, I have uh, a simple, simple, clear and straightforward message that I want to share with us on the occasion of uh, of this Resurrection Sunday. We know uh, the entire world, the entire Christian world is gathering today in different parts of the world to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, which is so significant in, the, in, the, in, the, in Christianity. As we say earlier on, unless Christ rose up in that day, on that day, beloved, our faith would have been in vain, as Paul even argued that in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So this morning we want to look at the benefit of the cross. By the way, when we're talking about the cross of Jesus, uh, uh, we are not just uh, actually referring just uh, to the cross as a piece of wood uh, per se. We are re referring uh, to the death of Christ uh, and also, more importantly, to his resurrection that we are celebrating today. Amen. Amen. There was a reason, or if you want the word reason, reasons why Christ died on the cross. And us as Christians, we need to know that the death of Christ and his, his resurrection has done and has brought so much unto us. And we need as Christians to enjoy all the benefits of the cross. But you will agree with me that Christ has accomplished so much on the cross, so much so that it's difficult to discuss every every single benefit of the cross and then in one sermon. Do you agree with me, right? Yeah. Because he has done so much, but uh, will enable by God's grace this morning to give you a couple of them. Just uh, we may, uh, I mean, we may claim them uh, in our lives. We may enjoy them. We may come. To know what is it that Christ has accomplished. As I'm saying again that Christ has done so much on the cross. But this morning we're just going to look at a couple of them to be a blessing unto us. And every single believer, Christian believer, need to be aware of this. Every single child of God need to know the works of Christ. What are their impact? What are their benefit? What did they or the what, what did they brought actually into your life and how you are to live now your life in Christ after resurrection. Somebody say amen. amen. So as I'm saying, I'll be, we'll be going look, touching a couple of them. I have such a long list, but I'll give you as much as I can for the glory of God. As I say, it was not in vain that God has released Christ to come here on, the, on earth to, to incarnate, to take on humanity and go suffer the cross, suffer humiliation and suffer a horrible, a terrible, a shameful death and more importantly, death on the cross. God did not do that just to plead, just, just for, for fun, no. God did not just do that to, to, uh, uh, to please himself, no. God did not do that just uh, I don't know for, for, for just for, for the sake of seeing what will happen. No, but God did that for a purpose. 
God was after our soul. God was after our salvation. Am I making sense right there? Although the Jewish religious, uh, the Jewish, Jewish religious leaders, uh, when they were plotting to kill Christ, uh, with the devil behind them, uh, in their mind, the first intention of them, as they were sending Christ on the cross, uh, it was not for him to fulfill what uh, God has planned, uh, but for them, it was for the sake of putting an end to his life. I don't know if I'm making sense right there. For them, let's kill this man. He's bothering us. He's bothering us. He goes about uh, preaching about uh, him being God, him being the son of God, him being the savior. And many of our people are now listening to him. Christ had become for them an embarrassment. Hallelujah. Let me tell you so a quick block of day. That's a reason why the witches of our family, they keep on fighting us. Because the Christ that is in us has become an embarrassment to their work. Mm -hmm. When they plot to eat somebody, to kill somebody through accident during this Easter, here you are on your, on your knees, God. I plead your blood over my family. I declare your blood over my husband and my wife and everything. At the end of the day, their plan failed. And then they gather, they say, but we put everything in place. Why is it that it did not work? No, there was somebody somewhere there that was praying that why it did not work. So that person is an embarrassment to us. Hallelujah, people of God. Sometimes we don't understand the presence of Christ, what it does in us. We are quick to complain God is not doing this and God is not doing that. But if truly you can open your eyes and see what God is doing, you will go on your knees and say, God, I praise you. Hallelujah. Christ was an embarrassment to them. He was an embarrassment to the devil. An embarrassment to the Jewish religious leaders, to the, the Pharisees, the scribes, uh, and all these people that they say, let us crucify him. You will see even when Pilate, after uh, judging Christ, he found no guilt in him. He came, he said, you don't find any guilt in this man. We need to release him, but the, the influence of uh, the people, as uh, it was a custom of that time during Easter, that they may release one of uh, uh, one of the prisoners, and they ask that Barabbas may be released, may be released, I'm going to come back to that, may be released, uh, then Christ may be, may be killed. For them, they were putting an end to Christ's life, but what they did not know, Christ uh, does not have an end, hallelujah. Christ was just living his life as he has planned it before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah, people of God. They killed him because he was an embarrassment. They killed him because he was an obstacle to what they want, to their fame and their business. But for Christ to go on the cross, it was planned by God. It was for the purpose, for the sake of saving life. Somebody say amen. For the sake of reconciling us uh, with God. So there is so much that Christ uh, has accomplished. That's why he could not avoid the cross. Even in the garden of Gethsemane, as he was praying, he prayed as he was facing the cross. It was so heavy that he prayed, Father, if it is possible that this cup may go away from me. And he goes on and says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Why? Because he knew what he will achieve through his death on the cross. Hallelujah. So there is so much benefit that we need to understand. So let us go through the list and see what we'll be able to cover up this morning. I'm giving them to you not according to following a chronological order. Am I making sense right there? I'm just giving it. does not follow any order. But I'm just giving you the benefit that the breath of Christ has brought. The benefit that the cross, the death and the resurrection of Christ has brought to us. The first benefit is what I call, first of all, substitutionary benefit. What do I mean by that? On the cross, as Jesus was dying for us, Jesus Christ took our place. Somebody say amen. amen. One thing that Christ did on the cross is that he took our place. Somebody say amen. amen. Christ was a holy, the holy one of God. He knew no sin. He did not commit any crime whatsoever that he could be blamed off. But on the cross, 
Jesus Christ did what? He, sub he took our place. He was our substitute. In fact, it was us who were supposed to be on that cross to die for our sin. But Jesus Christ, because of the love that he has for us, what did he do? He took our place on the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's turn our Bible in the book of Mark, chapter, chapter 15. That's what I was alluding to earlier on. Chapter 15 from verse 6. Mark 6, 15 from verse 6. Now, at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jewish? And for he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief, uh, the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do? With the man you call the king of the Jews. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, go, go, down, go, go, go. The next verse. And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. Verse 15. So Pilate, Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd, Release for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. You see, on that day, according to their custom, during Easter, the governor will release for them somebody that they wish, somebody that has been arrested, that was in prison, they will come and he said, who do you want, you want me to release? They will say, release so and so. And he will do that for them. No matter the crime that that person has committed, they will, he will deliver him unto them because they've asked and because that was their custom. Are you following me right there? Amen. Now that day, it happened that Jesus Christ was there. And Pilate has just, uh, I mean, interrogated him, questioned him over and over. And he did not find any guilt in Christ. He did not find any sin. And the Bible says he was finding a way of uh, releasing Jesus or setting Jesus Christ free. So he came and say, now, you know it's a custom and it's my custom that I may do this and that to release somebody. Do you want me today on this day of celebration that I may release, that I may release Jesus Christ for you? They say, no, the chief priest the chief priests were very angry. The Bible said they influenced the crowd. They say, no, do not release him. Release for us Barabbas. And Barabbas was a notorious criminal. He was a very bad man. Are you getting what I'm saying right here? He was a very bad man. A man that went about breaking in houses, killing and committing all sorts of atrocity. But on that day, is somebody had to die. The Jewish religious leader, they did not also know what they were doing. Pilate was trying by all means to release Jesus out of his good heart. He wanted to release him. And now the religious leaders on the other side, they did not know what they were doing. They said, no, you can't release him. Let him be killed. Let him be killed and release Barabbas. So, now, instead of killing the Barabbas, Jesus Christ took the place of Barabbas and Barabbas, a sinful man, was released. I don't know if I'm making sense right here. Beloved, we were the one to be crucified on that day. A good man was to be released because he did not do anything wrong. But he took our place. The good man went on the cross so that the sinner may be released. 
Are you getting what I'm saying there? Give me Romans chapter 5 verse 8 to confirm what we are saying right here. Paul later on will write, uh, write about this to make it clear. He said, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Beloved, can you see the love of God? Let me tell you, God did not start loving you the day you came in Christ. God started loving you before you were even born. The Bible says when we were still sinners, when we did not know even God, we did not even exist, God showed us his love in that Christ died for us. We were supposed to be the one dying on the cross. But the tree, the Bible trying, trying to change things. The Jewish religious leader, they thought that they were punishing Christ. But what they did not know, Christ was accepting to take, to, to go on the cross because he knew he was taking our place that we may be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you getting what I'm saying right there? Yeah. He took our place on the cross. Beloved, let me tell you, even until this very day, you may think that Christ did that once. And since then, he has forgotten about it. Let me tell you, until this very day, Christ is taking our place so that you and I may stay alive. I don't know if somebody get, get, get you what I'm saying right there. You remember what we preached on Friday? He told it's Peter, he says, Simon Peter, the devil has demanded you to sift you like we. But what did I do? I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. And when you return, strengthen the brethren. Beloved, every single day of our life, the devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom to devour. Do you know why he does not devour us? Because Christ always shows up. Amen. Hallelujah, Amen. people of God. Amen. When we look at the way we live our lives, sometimes we fall into sin. And you know whenever you fall into sin, you're supposed to face the wrath of God. Why is it that sometimes you don't face the wrath of God as you ought as a punishment to your sin? Because whenever you do, God is about to release his fury. Christ shows up and says, remember my death on the cross and have mercy on him. Oh, am I talking to somebody right there? Christ did not just take us to our place once. Even right now, he's Amen. taking our place. Amen. You may not know, maybe as I'm preaching here, somebody sitting in the church came well prepared saying, today you will not finish his sermon. I will take him down. As they sit there shooting their bullet, I'm not even aware of what is happening. As they are shooting, Christ shows up as a bullet shield and he's taking all the bullets so that I may stay alive. I don't know if I have a church that has ears to stand up and say, Glory to God. Come on, give him a hand of applause. He took our place, beloved, and he's still doing it even right now. Amen. Beloved, you are not covered by your prayer only. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. <laughs> if we can be honest and ask, just let everyone answer in his heart. Beside the time you attended church, when last did you, you alone, spend an hour in the presence of God in prayer? Lift up your hand in your heart. Then if you have hands. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying there? When last did you, just an hour, you alone, you wake up in the morning or in the middle of the night, or some of you say, I am going to pray. Some of you don't remember that. But it, it's also very amazing very shocking to see that you don't have a life of prayer at home. When it comes to the time of prayer, you say, I'm going to watch online. When you're watching online, you're answering messages on WhatsApp. You're watching TV. You're checking what is going around. You are just distracted and the devil is happy. Want you in that state. But, in spite of all that, the love of God is still protected. When you go to bed, you don't just know what is happening that night? You don't know the plot that has been put against you. But whenever they come, in one way, Christ shows up and he sent them away. I read a testimony of a certain woman in a book many years back. 
She said one day in the morning, one day in the morning, she saw this woman coming to her and was questioning her and saying, why is it that you don't sleep at night? You spend your night throughout the, you will go throughout the whole night just reading your Bible throughout the whole night. And she was like, no, I do go to bed and uh, sleep. She said, no, you don't sleep at night. We pass by here. Every night, whenever we pass by here, we found you reading your Bible. But physically, the woman did not, could not, I mean, actually understand what he was saying. Because she said she goes to bed every day, you understand? At night to sleep. But those who were coming after her, they would find her reading their Bible. Whenever they came looking for her, they would find her reading her Bible. While in reality she was in bed, but spiritually they could see her reading her Bible. Now that was Christ protecting her. Amen. Are you getting what I'm saying there? Amen. There is a man of God that I respect. Pastor Isaac was now in the United States. He went in Congo preaching, and he went into a certain village, and uh, in that village, they were so deep in witchcraft, so much so that no preacher would go there and preach the gospel. That was Mama Regine village, she knows. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying right there? Nobody will preach the gospel there. Whenever you try that, some preacher that has gone there, whenever they try that, they were found dead the following morning. He went there with a divine mandate and uh, and uh, he went there, and as they gave him the story uh, the, 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 after what happened, he, the, what they will do when you start preaching, during the day they will send a goat to pass before your, your house or wherever you are. Once you have seen that goat, the next day you cannot wake up, they will find you dead in your bed. So he came also not knowing what was happening. I get what I'm saying right there. What was happening that day? They have plotted to take his life away. They put everything in place to have him dead. To see him die. Dying the next day. But he went on preaching the gospel. He said in his testimony that he also saw during the time of day he saw a God passing before his house. Well, he finds it is normal in the village deep in the rural area. It is quite uh, normal. He did not find a problem out of that. And after he finished his cruise in the evening, he went to sleep. Now the entire village knew that the next day they will find him uh, dead. Amen. Mm -hmm. But to their surprise, the next day in the morning, he also not to know. He woke up, he took his towel, he put around uh, his neck, uh, and he took his uh, toothbrush and water in the cup. You know how we do traditional day there, right? Mm -hmm. You have done that. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And he opened his door. He went out there praising the Lord and brushing his teeth. Now the entire village was shocked to see that the man was uh, still alive and brushing his teeth. That's when now everybody came to him. They say, how are you alive? He said, I am alive. And they explained to him just what I have told you. Now you know what happened? Christ took his place. When that night they came to finish him up, Christ took his place and he stayed alive. Beloved, you may not just know how many times the Lord has spared your life. Trust me on that note. Are you getting what I'm saying there? You may not just know how many times Christ has spared your life. That's one of the benefits that we get from the cross. That Christ has decided to take our place on the cross, as I'm saying, until this very day, this very moment, as you are listening to this message, Christ is still taking your place. Hallelujah. When they gather plotting against your name, he shows up as your advocate. He say, I am here. Whatever you want to do to him, do it first to me. That's why the Bible says we are hidden in Christ and the Christ in God. 
If you want to judge me, judge first my God. If you overcome him, then you can find me. He has taken my place and has hidden me in him. I am hidden in Christ. No wonder some night you don't even pray. You just fall asleep and you wake up. You don't understand. You know what? Because your God does not sleep nor slumber. When you are sleeping, snoring and making noise to the point that even the neighbor cannot sleep, your God is watching over you. His blood is covering you that nobody can touch you. Somebody lift up your head and say, thank you, Jesus. Say it louder. Thank you, Jesus. That's the benefit of the cross, beloved. He has taken our place on the cross. And he's still doing the same even right now. Had it not been for that, beloved, I don't know what would have been right now. Hallelujah. Secondly, not only Christ took our place on the cross, but Jesus also took away our curse on the cross. Amen. Hallelujah, people Amen. of God. Not only he just took our place, but he also took our curse upon him. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, people of God. Amen. Are you with me right here? He also took our curse on him. Turn with me in the book of Genesis chapter 3. Let me try to give you a bit of background there and we move it here. Are you still following me here? Amen. Are you being blessed by the word of God? Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. Genesis 3, 17 to 18. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 18. And to Adam he said, Because of you, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me just correct something right there so that we, we don't avoid, we, we, we may remove some confusion and misinterpretation of the gospel. I heard somebody say, you should never listen to the voice of your wife. Adam listened to the voice of his wife. See what happened to him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You should listen to the voice of your wife. Amen. And examine everything in the light of the scripture. Amen. If she's right, let it be right. Because the both of you have become one. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Your wife is your half. Your wife is your partner. Your wife Share your life with you so you need to listen eh, to her. Are we together right there? Amen. Married men say amen. Because I'm only getting women voices here. I'm saying men, married men say amen. amen. I, I'm saying men, men, amen. Brother of did you say amen? Kaba, did you say amen? Okay, fine. Then give God the glory. <laughs> well, that was what I said, but I can't. Well, it's, oh, that's good. That's a lot. That's a convincing amen that is coming from the back. <laughs> Hallelujah. Brother Long, did you say amen? I didn't hear that. Amen. All right. <laughs> good. Well, he said this. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, I have commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse is in the ground because of you. In the pain, in, in pain you shall eat of uh, it, or you shall eat of it all, all the days of your life. Verse, the next verse. Thorns and thistle it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. Somebody say amen. amen. When Adam sinned before God, God pronounced some curse upon him and upon the ground. He said, because you have sinned, you have eaten of the forbidden tree. This is what will happen. He said, the ground will produce, will produce thorns and thistles. Because you, 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 because of your sin, it means it will be very difficult. You see, God said the ground will produce thorns and thistles. Thorns and thistles right there is, is a sign, a language of curse. That it will be difficult. Are you getting what I'm saying right there? Yeah. Are we together right there? Amen. As curse, God said, the earth will produce thorns and thistles. 
Now, years after, many, many years, centuries after, when Christ was on the cross, read with me now, Mark chapter 15, verse 17. Mark chapter, oh, brother, let's read this Psalm Matthew 27, verse 29. Let's go, Matthew 27, verse 29. Matthew 27, verse 29. The Bible says this. And uh, twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and uh, put a, a, a reed in his right hand and uh, kneeling, uh, kneeling before him, they mock him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Somebody say, Amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. The Bible tells us when they put the Christ on the cross, beloved. When they put him on the cross. Now one of the soldiers, because you see, the devil, even when he attacks us, he always makes mistakes. Are you following me, brother? He always makes mistakes. He does certain things. If he knew what he was doing, he wouldn't have done them. <laughs> I don't know if I'm making sense right there. Amen. Even those that are attacking you, if they know what in truth in fact they're doing, they would have stopped by themselves. Yeah. The Bible says, as he was on that cross, one of the soldiers had an idea in his mind. And he said, well, since he is the king, and every king has to have uh, a crown on him. Hallelujah. Amen. What he did not know, number one, Christ was on that cross not for himself, but he was taking somebody else's place. I don't know what I'm getting all that I'm saying right there. They say now, because he's the king, he needs the crown. What they did, they went, they pick up phones. From the phones, they make a crown. And they took that crown, they put it on him. Now, what they did not know. That the thorns that they were picking, it was a symbol of the curse. Because back then God said, the earth is cursed because of you and it will produce thorns and thistle. What they did not know, they just took thorns which was a symbol of a curse and they put it on him. Hallelujah. Amen. And on the cross, Jesus Christ became Curse so that you and I, we may be blessed. Give me Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Hallelujah. Am I talking to somebody right here? They thought they were punishing him. But what they did not know, he didn't do that because he was to become a curse so that you and I, we may be called blessed. He did not just take our place. He also took away our curse. The earth that wants to produce curse for us, Christ took curse on him. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Galatians 3 chapter 13. 3 verse 13 is saying, Christ redeemed us. Are you, are you with me right here? Yeah. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For his written curse is everyone who is hanged on the tree. He became a curse so that you and I, we may be blessed. Beloved, nobody has the power to lay a curse on you. Amen. Amen. Understand what I'm saying there? Oh, yes. No single man, Amen. no witches, no wizard can lay a curse on you. Amen. Because the biggest curse was already taken away. Amen. The Bible says that Christ, listen, on the cross the Bible says that he became cursed. He was not cursed on the cross, but he became cursed itself. Now, what other curse can you lay on us? Because if you want to lay a curse on us, Christ said, I became already that so that he may be free. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Sometimes you'll hear somebody ignorantly saying, Pastor, you feel like I'm cursed. Who can curse you, beloved? Who can curse what God has blessed? Amen. With which power? Hallelujah, people of God. Amen. Am I talking to somebody right there? Amen. Any spell. Declare against your life shall not prosper in the name of Jesus. Amen. Every curse 
that they lay upon you, your family shall not prosper in the name of Jesus. Amen. Even if your father was a witch or wizard, I don't know what he was doing, beloved, but the fact is, no family curse can be your portion. Amen. Am I talking to somebody right there? Oh, do I have a church? Somebody shout oh, yes. amen. amen. You cannot be sitting there and say, my grand-grandfather was suffering from this. My father suffered from the same thing. My mother suffered from the same thing. It looks like it's just our family case. No, I now belong to the family of Christ. Yes. Where my master became a curse that I may be blessed. Yes. No more family case. Yes. Oh, am I making sense right there? Yes. Oh no, pastor, this is a generational curse. No, I belong to a new generation. I belong to a new generation, a generation of those that are washed by the blood of Christ. This body that you say, this person that you see here, no curse can stand upon it and succeed. It cannot work. Are you getting what I'm saying right there? It cannot work. They can gather things, gather multi. They say, go and throw it in the office. By the time you will step there, you will see what will happen to his leg. He will come and he will step and hit him and say, what is this? You pick it up and you go and throw it in the bin. <laughs> I don't know if any sense right there. Now, whoever that did that will be watching. Watching there the whole day until the day the day end. You go back home. The next day you come free and he ask. He start wondering. Go back to that song and say, whatever you gave to me did not work. He said, he could not work because that man, you cannot curse him. Balaam, hired Balak, he said, Come and curse Israel from me. And the Bible says he gave him the nine, nine spot. He stood on the mountain where he could see Israel coming. He said, here they are. Curse them. But when Balaam, listen to this brother. When Balaam stood up and he opened his mouth, he was about now to pray, to start laying curse on them. The first word he said, they say, who can curse what the Lord has uh, blessed? Mm. But like became angry, say, I have hired you. I have paid you money not to bless them, to curse them. But for three times you're going on uh, blessing them over and over and over and over. Beloved, let every curse that they are laying on you may turn into blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Every obstacle step before you, let it become and I get, like, let it become like your trampoline. Let it become like your, 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 your footstep. That it may help you to escalate. They thought they put it there to send you down. But let it send you up because your God was made a curse for you, beloved, to be free in the name of Jesus. Amen. No one can lay a curse on you. Hallelujah. Amen. Thirdly, not only he took our place, he took our, 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 our curse away. On the cross as well, Christ covered our nakedness. Amen. I say on the cross, Christ covered our nakedness. Amen. The Bible tells us in Mark chapter 15, verse 24, that when Christ was on the cross, do you know that Christ was crucified naked? He was crucified naked. When they put him on the cross, they tried to cover his nakedness. But the truth of the matter, on the cross, he was hanged naked. Out of the city. Are you, are you with me right here? Mm. Out of the city. He was hanged dead, naked. And the Bible says, they took his garments. They took his garments. And they casted a lot on it to know who will take it. Are we coming together right there? They took his cloth. They, they fought for his cloth. They cast a lot to know who will take it. And they crucified him and divided his garment among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. They divided his cloth when he was hanging there naked on the cross. Again, one thing you need to understand, as I say, the devil always makes mistakes. Are you still following me right here? Even those that are fighting you, they are still making mistakes. Just watch out. If you remain faithful, you will catch them in their mistakes. 
Does somebody agree with me right there? I say remain watchful. You will catch them in their mistakes. Hallelujah. You will catch them. Even your husband is cheating on you. Stay in prayer. You will catch him in his mistake. And you will repent. Hallelujah. But I, I pray that every son and daughter of this house may have a happy and peaceful marriage in the name of Jesus Christ. No man should cheat on his wife. Not even a woman should cheat on her husband. Am I making sense right there? They always make mistake. They hang him naked on the cross. But what they did not understand, Christ on the cross was our substitute. When you read the book of Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, you'll find that the Bible tells us this. After Adam and Eve, they ate, they ate from the forbidden tree. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 to 7, they realized that they were naked. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you following me right there? They realized that they were naked. Beloved, let me tell you that they realized that they were naked when, when the sin entered their lives, right? Now, the glory of God that was covering their nakedness has departed from them. Now they realized that they were naked. Hallelujah. One thing a child of God needs to understand. Spiritually, when we sin, sin undress us. Are you getting what I'm saying right here? Yeah. As you go about sinning, you think nobody sees you, nobody's watching, nobody will know. These days, pastor is no more giving prophecy, will not give the prophecy of what I did the previous night. <laughs> but what you need to know that whenever you go on sinning, sin undresses you. Sin causes the glory of the Lord to depart from you. And what happened as a result, you remain exposed. That's why you will see if the enemy want to bring a child of God down, the first thing that you want to do he want to lead you into sin. Mm -hmm. yes, oh, you become too quiet. Yes. <laughs> this is a portion that the church doesn't like. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah, people of God. Amen. Check your neighbor. Say, lift up your hand. You need to listen to this. <laughs> lift up your hand. You need to listen to this. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. When you jump from one bed, one hotel room to the other, when you keep on stealing from your boss, lying to your husband, to your wife, to your parent, what you do not know sins and dresses you before God. It left, it leaves you naked and exposed. It leaves you naked and exposed to any demonic attack. Hallelujah. Amen. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. The moment they see. You see, let me face it, we love the children of God here. Yeah. You know, when everything is alright in your life, you feel okay. But the moment you have done something wrong as a child of God, those, I'm talking especially to those that are walking in the fear of the Lord. Those who still have the fear of the Lord in them. Whenever you just commit a sin, you just lie, immediately inside you, you become uncomfortable. Because something strange has, become, has entered your life. If you don't feel that, <laughs> if you don't feel that, that means you have already lost the network. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. If you are still connected to the heaven, if you still have good signal of heaven, the moment you even think of insulting somebody in your mind, you start becoming uncomfortable because something strange is entering in your life. And you cannot keep it. You say, Father, forgive me. Because you want to have that covering at all times. Now, why is it that Christ was to be unrest? Because he was taking our sin. 
They had to take his cloth away that he may remain naked on the cross so that we may be covered by his cloth. Today, beloved, if we are protected, it's because the blood of Christ is covering us. The reason why God is forgiving us our sins is because of the blood of Christ that is covering us. When we ask for forgiveness, God sees the nakedness of Christ on the cross. He covered us with the blood of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. In Genesis, when Adam and Eve, after they realized that they committed sin, they realized that they were naked. The Bible says they took her. Olive tree leaves, I mean, and what they did, they sew cloth for themselves to cover their nakedness. They covered their nakedness with the leaves. But us, Christ knew, knowing that, he knows that the leaves cannot cover your, your nakedness for long because after a time, it will dry up, you will need another one. That's why on the cross he became naked so that you and I we may be covered by his blood. We are covered today because Christ was naked on the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 tells us this. He who knew no sin, God made him sin on the cross. He became cursed and he became sin on the cross. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, Christ covered as he paid for our sin. He was our substitute. Not only he took our curse away, away, he became sin and he paid a great price to God so that you and I, we may become the righteousness of God. Am I talking to somebody right there? Amen. Am I talking to somebody right there? Hallelujah, people of God. He became a sin. By becoming sin, he paid the price. Because men are sin before God. Men deserve God's punishment. Men deserve God's wrath. Men deserve to rot in hell. But on the cross, Christ became our substitution. Christ became our sacrificial lamb. He offered himself. God made him a sacrifice to offer himself, to offer Christ to himself, to appease the wrath of God, so that we may be made the righteousness of God. Amen. We are standing before, before God in prayer because Christ, beloved, has become sin for us. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me give you two more and then we're going to close. Right. As I say, I have a long list. Let me give you two more and then we're going to close it. Number four. Am I right there? Yeah. Fourthly, the death or the benefit, or the fourth benefit of the cross is that uh, the cross has given us access into the presence of God. Hallelujah. When man is seen, there was a huge gap between man and God. But Christ became and he became our bridge to connect those who believe in him that they may not perish but have eternal life. Let's read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19. He says this, it says this. Therefore brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. By the new way and the living way that he opened for us through the curtain that, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in the full assurance of faith with our heart sprinkled clean from a clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with the pure water. Somebody say amen. amen. Mark 15, 38 tells us this. When Christ died, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to 
bottom. Hallelujah. Amen. The concatenation of the temple that was separating the most holy place, the, the holy place was torn apart to symbolize that the, the access to the presence of God was now open and made accessible to everyone who believed in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. The benefit of cross, beloved, today we are enjoying the presence of God. Amen. In the Old Testament, people had to go. In the Old Testament, people had to go. They had to go to the mountain to look for God. They had to go here. They had to go there to look for God. God had to get an appointment with them. Moses, show yourself on the mountain, I will be there. Elijah, show yourself on the mountain, I will be there. But in our day, the presence of God has become accessible to us. Amen. In the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, only the high priest was entering once a year the most holy place where the presence of God was. Only one person was entering the most holy place once a year, once a year to ask for forgiveness of himself and for the entire nation. Once a year. But because of the death of Christ, now we can enter the presence of God 24 hours 7. Amen. 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 You don't have to wait for Sunday so that you may pray. No. Monday in the morning you can pray. At the noon you can pray. God has brought his presence in us. He lives in us 24 hours 7. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am always in. Ever since he has come in our life, nothing and no one can take him out of our lives. Amen. Hallelujah. Finally, let me close with this one. Beloved, one of the benefits of the cross is that the cross has given us a new life. Hallelujah. The cross has given us a new life. The Bible says those that are in Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said those that are in Christ, verse 17, those that are in Christ, Christ, hallelujah. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is now a new creation. Amen. The old thing have passed away. Behold, behold. Behold, the new has come. Somebody say amen. amen. One of the benefits of the cross is that it has given us new life. Amen. We have a life now because of the cross of Jesus Christ. In Christ, beloved, some of us, whom days before, years before, we were known as the no name, but because of Christ, we have a value today. Amen. Am I talking to somebody right there? Some of the people, beloved, you are who you are today because the blood of Christ has washed you. Do you know that beloved Christ beautifies us? Amen. I don't know if I'm making sense right here. Yes. Do you agree with me on that note, beloved? Yes. There are people that we have known before Christ and after they are in Christ. When you look at their life before Christ, they were ugly, they did not have anything to look, that, that you could look at them. But after they came to Christ, he has washed. Hallelujah. He has washed them. They have become even now presentable. Hallelujah, people of God. Some of us, no names. Coming from a no name family. Hallelujah. Coming from a no name family. Some of you with no solid background. No big degree in life. But Christ has given meaning into your life. Am I talking to somebody right there? Yeah. Hallelujah, people of God. Yeah. That's why I love Christ. With his blood, he covers our flaws. With his blood, he covers our mistakes. And he gives us meaning before people. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, people of God. Yeah. He gives us meaning before people. Hallelujah, people of God. You don't have something to show off, but Christ has given you life. 
Romans chapter 8, I'm finishing there. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Tell me, I want you, I want you to turn there. I want you to turn there. I want you to turn there. Turn into that passage. I'm done there. Romans 11, 8, verse 11. I want everybody to turn there, and then we're going to read it in unison, and we'll close there because this is so big because Christ has given us value. He has given meaning to our life. Somebody say amen. He has given meaning to your life, my son. He has given you meaning. Can you say amen? I say he has given life to you. Now the Bible says this. I want you to read with understanding. This verse the Bible says now. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he will raise Christ from the dead will also give a life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, if the spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead, the Bible say, if the same spirit lives in you on this day of the resurrection, the very same spirit will give life to your mortal body. It will quicken you. It will revitalize you. It will give a sense of meaning to your life. We know the people who do not know where they were heading to. They don't know whether they were going or they were coming. But ever see they are in Christ. The spirit of the Lord has given them life. Now they know where they are heading to. Am I talking to somebody right there? Am I talking to somebody? Do I have a witness in the house to give to the Lord a round of applause? Somebody give him a round of applause. He has given you meaning, the Bible say. The problem is that if the spirit of Christ lives in you, it gives life to your mortal bodies. Christ does not just resurrect you. If his spirit lives in you, whatever you lay your hands on, begin to receive that very same life. Even your dying business, because of the resurrection of Christ, and his spirit that lives in you, your business begin to receive life. Am I talking to somebody right there? Do I have witness in the house right? May your marriage begin to live again in Jesus' name. May your study begin to live again. May your finance begin to live again. The Bible says if his spirit lives in you, it will quicken your mortal bodies. It will quicken part of your body that will die. It will quicken those studies that were dying. You started losing hope. All of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord begin to give you life. Some non-name people, today they have a name. Yesterday, known as a non-name. What does he have? Who does he have? What can he do? But what I do not know, ever since Christ has come into my life, he has changed my life. He has given us a meaning. Hallelujah, people of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you, are you with me right here? I pray that the life of God may be manifested in you. That the real value that you have received in Christ may begin to show up. Beloved, let me tell you today, if I am respected in my family, it's not because I'm the one with most money in the family, but because I am the one who has God, who's, who brought God in our family. Hallelujah. To the point that you cannot do family meeting without consulting first the last born of the family. Unless if you want to gossip. <laughs> because they will say, don't bring him in. <laughs> he, will not, he will not agree to that. But, when it's serious family meeting, they know, call first that one and call the past. Hallelujah. Why? Though I'm the last born, the Lord has given me value. I have a word to say because of Christ. Beloved, some of you maybe right now you're not yet experiencing that. But let me tell you, there is great value hidden inside you. There is great value hidden inside you. What you just need to do, beloved, is to allow the Spirit of God the spirit that raised Christ from the dead, you allow it to operate in you and begin to live, give you life. Am I talking to somebody right here? Allow the spirit to move. Allow the spirit of God, the free movement in you. 
He will give life to your mortal body. He will quicken it. He will quicken that dying part of your life. It will come alive because the Spirit given life. Am I talking to somebody right there? The Spirit, the death of Christ, beloved, has given us a new life. We were sold in sin. Do you know some of us as African? Many of us, we come from very bad families. In fact, like somebody say, if you dig deep in every African family, you'll find at least one witch. Right? <laughs> one. Our forefathers did not know God. They worship idols. Right? They worship idols. They sold us, some consciously or unconsciously, they sold us to the enemy. They laid curse their family with curse, with words that say, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. That's what our life looks like before Christ. But I thank God that when we come in Him, He takes away that old life. He takes away that life of sin. That life of limitation. That life where to say you will die poor. He takes it away. He gives you a new life. Where He say you are the head and not the tail. Where He say everything you lay your hand on will turn well in the name of Jesus. I pray that the new life of God may begin to manifest inside you. If only you will let the Spirit of the Lord to move inside you. If only you will allow the cross to have its way in you. If only you will allow Christ to have way in your business, beloved. Your life will no longer be the same. Your life will no longer be the same as you continue to give yourself to God. Few years down the line, those that will see you, they will not recognize you because you will be covered by the glory of God. It will begin to shine in you so much so they will say, truly this is the blessed one of the Lord. Somebody say amen. The life of Christ has given us life. They sent him on the cross thinking that they were putting an end to his life. But what they did not know him going on the cross was to fulfill the divine plan that was set in place before the foundation of the world. Him going in the, on the cross was to give us eternal life. Him going on the cross was to redeem us. Him going on the cross was to take our place. Him going on the cross was to take away our curse. Him going on the cross was to cover our nakedness. Him going on the cross was suffered so that you and I we may have life. And Paul say, if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead lives in us, he will also quicken our mortal body. God want his life to be fully manifested in you. He want his life to be fully manifested in everything that you do. But the problem is the church need to allow the spirit of the Lord to operate in us. Hallelujah, people of God. Amen. If we will pay attention to the spirit of God, if only we will yield and let him move in us, if we will submit ourselves under the authority of his word, live our lives not the way we want, but the way the spirit of God wants us to live, we will see the life of God flowing in us like rivers. No one will lay a curse on us because he became a curse. No one will stand on our way. God told Joshua, for as long as you will live, nobody will stand before you. If you commit yourself to do according to the word that is written in the Buddhist book of the law, you shall have success in all you're doing. Beloved, the point is, allow the spirit of the Lord to move inside you. Let the spirit of the Lord work. Let the spirit of the Lord work. You know, if you allow him to start ministering unto you, you will not fall in some of the trouble that you're falling into. In some places, you will just tell you, keep quiet and I will speak on your behalf. In some places, he say, just keep quiet. Sometimes you are about to pray, say, just worship and let me do the rest. Am I talking to somebody right there? Hallelujah, people of God. 
Anytime you want to sing, he say, don't sing. Just take your Bible. Start walking around confessing the word of God. As you will be declaring the word, I'll be doing certain things in the spiritual realm. If you will allow him to work inside you, you can go one day in your business. There is nothing happening. You don't see any customers showing up. Instead of being discouraged, you start just praising the Lord. You start just praising the Lord. Hallelujah. Because you don't know what God is doing. When we obey the Spirit, the Spirit releases life. Hallelujah. May my God reach me. Bless you. Give unto our Lord the love of our Lord. And if you will, do stand on your feet. Do stand on your feet for a moment.